Hello and welcome to this episode of the Fortnightly Dispatch, brought to you by the Baker Street Irregulars. I'm Steve Doyle and I'm your host. So, I'm very excited to bring our guest to the show today. Today we are uh, welcoming David Stewart Davis to the show. David is, uh, as many of you know, is a uh, prolific author, uh, mystery author, playwright, um, Sherlockian film scholar, a journalist. He has uh, uh, he has written uh, detective novels and uh, Sherlock Holmes pastiche. Um, and um, plus, he's a really fun guy to talk to and and to know. So without any further ado, we have so much to talk to. Let's just get on with the show. So welcome to the show, David. It's really great to have you here today. It's lovely to be here. And it's very, very good to be invited. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure. Um, you and I have known each other a long time now. You know, I, so. <laughs> <laughs> for better or worse. <laughs> it's, 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 it's amazing, actually. You just forget the timeline of things with people that you've met, and 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 it's like, God, is it so? Uh, you know, we no doubt at some point we'll be talking about Jeremy Brett, and it it only struck me today that it's twenty five years since Bending the Willow came out. You know, I know. You know, it's it it. I've been thinking about uh, that kind of thing too. Um, you were hitting all these sort of anniversaries, right? Of, yeah. you know, of uh, things like that. And um, and when when it occurs to you, you're right. It's it's like could it could that really be a quarter century ago? Yeah, yeah. And um, every time you hear that somebody, for instance, on the Granada series, um, every time you hear that uh, somebody like that has has um, you know, passed away. It just reminds you of how of how many of them are gone now, and how that almost seems impossible. So I think the only the only major person connected with the series who is still alive is David Burke. Right, our first yeah. Watson. I mean, we we just lost Michael Cox uh, mm -hmm. just the other day, um, and yeah. obviously all the the uh, main players in the series, Mrs. Hudson, the other Dr. Watson, uh, dear Edward Hardwick, and obviously Jeremy and so forth. Exactly. Oh, and, and Mycroft and, well, yeah, all gone. I know, it's amazing. Well, we'll get to that uh, a little down the road, but I just wanna, um, for uh, one of the goals of this podcast is to um, uh, introduce so many new Sherlockians um, all the time and, and um, I just have the desire to introduce them to people who they, who I have the great pleasure of knowing, and um, they should too. So that's what this, a, a lot of this is about. Yeah. And so, um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, your background, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the things you've done. Um, so, David, where are you coming? First of all, where are you coming to us from today? I'm coming to you from Yorkshire, um, the, the town of Huddersfield, which is situated about midway between Manchester, and football fans will know Manchester United, Manchester City, and Leeds, both big, big cities. Um, so I'm just on the brink of the wonderful Yorkshire Dales. So within a short distance from me, I've got two rather large uh, attractive cities to visit but also wonderful rolling countryside. So it's a lovely place to be. That's great. Now, when... I, and just to add, I've been here all my life. I, unfortunately, <laughs> I can't say I've lived in Malibu. I've been to Africa. I, I, was, <laughs> I was born in Huddersfield and I'm still here. They won't let me go. <laughs> well, it must be a terrific place to stay that long. <laughs> the, um, and that's, nor that's northern England, right? That's in the north. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So um, for us here in America who are uh, UK geographically challenged, that's, <laughs> that's north. <laughs> that's north, yeah. It's north. Below Stoffland. <laughs> Just below <laughs> yeah. So I, I like to ask this question mostly just because I always like to know. How did you, what, how did you fall under the spell of Sherlock Holmes? 
Well, it's interesting because uh, I suspected you, you'd ask that question today. And with the, the lockdown that we have here, um, most things are closed, no shops are open and so forth, but we're encouraged to do a walk. And uh, only this week I, I, I went out for my walk and I walked to uh, the school where I was um, educated. And uh, it's no longer a school, it's actually uh, be, was turned into a college and then was closed down and it's now been converted into flats. Uh, and it's like a building site, but I was able because of that to walk around the perimeter of the building trying to capture memories of my time at childhood and walked in front of the bay window of the school library as it was and I I remembered sometimes there are moments in your life that are, are sort of captured in in aspic or whatever and they're there forever and I remember going up the stairs because it was on two levels of the library, looking at the fiction section and seeing The Hound of the Baskervilles. And it had a very interesting cover, the sort of the, the hound leaping out of the fog at a, a, a strange, you know, a silhouetted man. Right. Really. Yeah. And I remember picking it off the shelves, and that was the start of it all. What combined the excitement of that was at the time. Um, the local TV station was showing the Rathbone movies. And uh, I remember I, I'd be out in the garden and my mum would come out and say, David, Sherlock Holmes is on. And I'd rush into the house. And uh, interestingly enough, the, the, uh, the TV company showed them totally out of sequence. So you'd get the last film first and, and the voice of terror at the end of the series or whatever. But, um, but seeing Rathbone as Holmes and reading The Hound of the Maskervilles, those two things merged to me. And I, the phrase I've used uh, a lot is I was sold into Sherlockian slavery at that moment in time. <laughs> That's a very familiar experience. I, yeah. I got some books for Christmas and they were showing the Rathbone movies on Sunday morning. Um, and just I, at one point, going. at one point I, I used to feel a little bit embarrassed about saying, well, uh, you know, it was Basil Rathbone did a lot for me in the home thing, because I thought it's not very academic now. And then I met Tony Howlett, who was uh, chairman of the Sherlock Holmes Society of London, who was a Rathbone nut. Uh, and <laughs> uh, and we, we shared lots of conversations about the films together. So, uh, and, and as you say, when you, you're around with a group of Sherlockians, of a certain age anyway, um, they, will, they will say, oh, Rathbone had a great influence on me. Indeed. Well, that's so interesting. The, um, so um, you and I share uh, a, uh, a uh, love of Sherlockian cinema. Yeah. I will tell our viewers that, um, that um, not only am I the publisher of the journal, but I also... Uh, am co-publisher of West Express and Gassaging Books. And we have sponsored over, oh my gosh, 15, 20 years now, it seems like time flies, right? Um, five Sherlockian film co uh, conferences. And David is the only speaker who has been to every one of them. <laughs> that's how fond of him we are. Yeah, and, that's true. Um, <laughs> but David, you, you do share, we share a love of Sherlockian cinema. Do you think that comes from those, that early influence of the movies that you were? I, I think so. I mean, uh, Holmes is, I mean, Holmes is a very theatrical character and he, he immediately lent himself to uh, dramatized versions. I mean, before The Hound of the Baskervilles was published, there was at least one. Sherlock Holmes movie. And, and every decade has had at least one Holmes movie since you know, the beginning of the 19th century, uh, uh, 20th century rather. And uh, it, it, it's a, he's, a, he's such a fascinating character and usually attracts some of the really good actors to attempt them, attempt the part. I do think they find it to be a challenge. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll get really a really top shelf actor and you think, well, why would he be, you know, he, you think he'd be wanting to do some very serious drama or something, but he's a character that they always want to seem, seem to want to tackle. 
I can't remember which actor said it. it, it it's um, playing Sherlock is just as difficult as Hamlet. And, in, and certainly, one of the great British actors, uh, uh, John Gielgud, who did Homes on Radio, was, was very poor at that. He, he, he couldn't capture the character at all. Uh, and yet, sort of, uh, sort of lesser actors have been able to slip in very, very easily into the part. Gielgud's an interesting example of how, you know, I mean, John Gielgud, right? <laughs> there he is. And there he is doing Sherlock Holmes on the radio. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So yeah. That's a good... That's with with Orson Welles as uh, Moriarty. Right. That <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's good stuff. Yeah. So I want to just... So you're, you're, you wrote, you've you wrote written a number of books about Sherlock yeah. film. And um, I remember getting this one. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Holmes of the Movies. 1978, I think, is when this came out. Uh, 76, I think. 76. I know it was 70s. Yeah. I was, I was on fire with Sherlock Holmes and um, walked into a local bookstore and there this was. And so uh, got this. And I, for a long time, this was sort of my definitive Holmes in the movies book. Yeah. It's, I have an interesting story about that because, yeah. uh, well, first of all, it was uh, when I was at university, uh, this this is a, a well-told tale, actually. But when I was at university and I wanted to do my final dissertation on Conan Doyle, and I was told uh, that he wasn't important enough a writer for me to to spend my time on. So to compensate for that, I thought, well, I'll write about Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle in my own way, and I'll focus on our interest, the movies, and so. In my last year at university, while working on my dissertation, I wrote Homes of the Movies. And remarkably, I sent it off to the first publisher and they accepted it. Wow, that's pretty, that's great. <laughs> and um, the other little story which uh, Mark Gatiss told me, because um, he, he grew up with the, the Rathbones too, and it was a book he desperately wanted his parents to buy him for Christmas and he told me that he said I got up very early in the early hours of Christmas morning went down to the tree and saw this book which had paper Christmas paper wrapping around it <clears throat> and he said I scratched away the paper just to reveal the title and he said oh it was Holmes I knew I'd got it and I thought how marvelous for that yeah and, you know wow. as a, a great writer himself and a great Sherlockian to to feel that yeah, isn't that wonderful? What a great story that is. But you know, I can I can understand that one too. Now I want to point out a couple other ones. You uh, also wrote. I'm gonna, I'm not going. These are not necessarily in the order that they were published. No. So I'm going to also point out this one. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Yes, I got I've got a wrap, so they're kind of reflective here. Yeah, Let's, yeah. Uh, well, well, that was done for that was done for Titan and. Uh, it, yes, was difficult, it was a difficult book to do in one sense yeah. because I had a template. Yeah, well, we worked that out. With, I, who was going to be on the front cover? Would it be <laughs> yeah. Rathbone right. or Brett? You can, so, you can take your pick. There's yeah, yeah. Brett. Or if you're more old school, you can have Rathbone. Absolutely. I have to show some pictures of this. Yeah, it's a super one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah but uh, that's a wonderful book. Well, it was uh, it was difficult to do because I was given a template by uh, Titan. Um, so I said, well, some films deserve actually more wordage than others. But I had to do the set wordage for um, each film. So it, it, sometimes it meant expanding the text more than I would like and reducing it more than I would like. But nevertheless, it seems to work. The, the, nice, thing, the nice thing about it was that I would say... 60 60 percent at least of the stills uh used in the book came from richard lanceling green mm. uh, his collection and uh, i went to his house in london uh one, one day well i say one day i was there all day because he kept bringing, <laughs> i bet <laughs> he, he kept bringing them out bringing them out bring, I, I, in the end i went away with a suitcase full of stills to, to sort out he was so kind and generous in that way. 
trusting me. I mean, I could have been up to the continent. Um, right. <laughs> thanks for these. See ya. <laughs> Actually, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Well, it's profusely illustrated and it's, uh, it's, it's lovely. It's, it's, it's curious to me. Um, so when you were writing that book with a template, so some, some movies, some films probably, you know, only had that much you wanted to say about it, but you had Absolutely, to, you had yes, to sort yes. of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure funny. comes with the deadly necklace springs to mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Less said about that one, the better, I think. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> well, also, now this is, um, we've, got a oh, we've got a couple here. Um, we have Dancing in the Moonlight. It's a celebration of Jeremy Brett, and that's yeah. a fine book. Really nice book. Um, really good. And course, despite, despite the fact that they spelt my name wrong on the cover, which was- Did the they? One, without the E. Oh, they did. Oh, well, gosh. Shows you how I see, but I do not observe. So here's, uh, and and then the one that I think is one of a, a, a cornerstone book about Brett and Granada is uh, your your book Bending the Willow. Yeah. And I, I think this is a really, if you are a uh, if you are a fan of the Granada series, you really all you viewers out there, you really should have, find yourself a copy of Bending the Willow. It is, it's magnificent. And, um, and um, really lovely tribute to uh, the show and to Jeremy Brett. Um, so let's talk about him for a little bit. Let's talk about sure. that show. Yeah. Um, we, um, you, uh, you met him a number of times, is that right? I did, yeah. I, I even went to his house on a couple of occasions, or his, his, his apartment, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting because it was through Michael Cox. It's Holmes of the Movies again, because Michael Cox had read Holmes of the Movies. So when <clears throat> I uh, wrote to him uh, to ask if I could interview Jeremy, uh, his name, uh, my name was known to him, and he had a copy of Holmes of the Movies. So he wasn't thinking this as some sort of avid fan who just wants to stroke Jeremy's coat or something. So he, he arranged for an interview um, on the location of uh, the Pound of the Baskervilles, the location being Liverpool Docks, which they were filming there. Um, and uh, I arrived and I was taken by the sort of PR girl to Jeremy's very large Winnebago where he'd just been finished making up. And this very crisp young lady PR girl said you've got 10 minutes no more oh, I thought my I've come all this way <laughs> 10 minutes no more so I thought well yes I suppose he has a lot of people coming in fair enough so I sat down with him and introduced me and he said oh you 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 know Michael and blah 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 and we started talking and he started talking about the, the scene in the hand of the Baskervilles where uh, he sees Watson through the coffee pot and saying how he filmed it the day before and he was explaining and I I was chipping in with knowledge about the scene knowledge about the story and after about 10 minutes the PR girl came and she said time to go and Jeremy a typical Jeremy said we're fine we're fine leave us alone and I was with him in another hour well, it is so lovely. I want to. Can I share a story similar yes, yes, to that? Yes, of course. Yes. So yes, I know um, you interviewed him too. Oh yes. Well, I did. I, I, I twice. Um, and um, once telephone interview, and then once in person when he came to America to uh, do a sort of a publicity tour for the public television stations, and he was in Chicago. And so uh, our mutual friend Mark Gagan and I went up to Chicago. Somehow I'd called the station, and I. You know, I said, yes, I'm Steve Doyle from the Sherlock Holmes Review. Uh, um, I'd like to get an interview with Jeremy. And, and so somehow we, we got in along with all the news, local newspaper people. And um, same experience, David. You know, they were coming in and out in 10-minute intervals. And then yeah. when we got in there, I had a copy of the first review that I had interviewed him in. And he was like, oh, oh, come in, my friends, come in. And he sat <laughs> down. And the same thing, 10 minutes later, uh, Mr. Brett, the next person, he's like, oh, no, go away. I'm talking to my friends now. <laughs> yeah, that, that, and we were there like 45 minutes. I, th I, think, I think it was because of his love of Doyle and wanting to put Doyle on screen that anyone who knew newspaper men and said, 
you're playing Sherlock what or you know um, um, what's it all about we knew what we knew what it was about and and he he delighted in that there was an yes. an interesting uh, uh, adjunct to to my story um about a week after i did the first interview the phone rang uh, and we were just about to eat our evening meal and oh who rings at this time? so i picked his phone up and and he said hello david it's jeremy now some god <laughs> above stopped me saying jeremy who <laughs> and he just said i just want to correct something that i said in my interview with you it blah 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 blah. so he must have played on his mind and felt uh, i want this to be right and he rang me to tell me it's, it's so interesting it's remarkable, so man. remarkable man remarkable Remar man. i found him to be because you know when, until you meet him you know you're really your only perception is the character he's playing and he plays it so convincingly yeah. you think oh my god i'm gonna go see sherlock holmes now you know and then he was so generous with his time and appreciative like you said yeah oh i'm with people who understand what i'm doing that was yeah. i always i thought that was kind of amazing <laughs> but that's an interesting thing that he followed up with you about something yeah 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 he just said i just want to correct something that i said i can't remember what it was now but as i say i'm, I'm so pleased because i think if i'd have said jeremy who would put the phone down <laughs> So I I, there's no Je <laughs> to the phrase, there's no Jeremy's in my life. <laughs> Hold dinner. I'll be. <laughs> we'll wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so funny. So, did you did you have an opportunity to visit the set more than once? Yes, I did. Um, I, I I went to to uh, the actual Baker Street set and spent a morning on the set watching. It's the scene from. Uh, Lady Frances Carfax, where he has a little model on the on the mantelpiece, and he no has to knock it onto the hearth, onto a newspaper, and it was time after time to knock it over and get it right. Uh, but it was just fascinating, and he was uh, um, not at all irritated by the fact that we had to repeat it all. In the afternoon, then we we went to the cemetery where they're burying uh, the lady francis carfax um and uh, there was a, the shooting scene and everything so it was, it was wonderful to see uh all that and of course uh i, I also did the uh uh what's it called uh the, the they put two stories together and i can't remember what it's called but it was a, it was the 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 day after he became very ill and was hospitalized mm. it was, i went to his winnebago then and he, and he had his white Sherlock face on and he looked absolutely dreadful he looked you know dead as it were and uh -huh. of course he gained in weight with the the, the drugs that he'd, he'd taken it's quite uh, a tragic story it was a it was a three gables story um, um yeah. uh, and master uh, stone i forget was that they combined no it wasn't the master because he, he was not in that but um anyway it doesn't matter really but yeah he was always uh kind to me i mean i've heard people say he was very cross at times but he was always very kind with me so i, I can only judge him on what how he how he treated me yeah yeah he was yeah. always like i said he was he was really uh very kind and generous and and um yeah. a week doesn't go by now when i don't get a tweet uh about jeremy and often about bending the willow um, there, there, there is a, a move afoot. It's in the very early stages of hoping that uh, we can reprint, uh, because it's ridiculous uh, to try and get a copy now without spending. Oh my gosh, they're really expensive in the used. Yeah, and, and the annoying thing is I don't get any, any royalties. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where's my cut of that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I tell you, we, we watched uh, the, the Norwood Builder the other night, which was from the first series. Right. And uh, you just are reminded how absolutely brilliant he was. That mm. he, ha he had extra muscles in his face, didn't he? The, 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 the twitch Seems of like the eye, the, the, the crease of the lips. Uh, it, fantastic performance. Uh, and he's in such perfect physical shape you know yeah. i mean he's just literally 
physically embodying that character. Yeah. And um, it is striking, particularly if, as many of us have, we've watched throughout the entire series and, you, and the, the weight gain and the, and the age and stuff kind of comes in gradually. So you don't notice it as much over time. But when you jump back to those first couple of seasons. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So do you think it's still the, the most close? I mean, how, how do you think of that series as a, uh, as uh, in the pantheon of interpretation? Well, well it, it's that the, 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 the early series, they, they were, they made some terrible errors later on, like the sitting in the street in his dressing gown, in his nightshirt. Yes. Uh, uh, but the, the early, the early series, even the ones, you know, uh, where we had, Edward Hardwick as, as Watson rather than David Burke. I think that they are the best. I don't think they've, they've been bettered. If you're thinking about bringing Conan Doyle to the screen, Conan Doyle shall comes to the screen. Um, there is a, a viewpoint that now that's been done to some extent. Let's have Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes, but with some new stories. I don't particularly want to see another actor do you know, the Hound of the Baskervilles, it's been done to death. Uh, let's have a different story, but, uh, you know, a great, a great Holmes. I think we're in, in time for a great Holmes now. I mean, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch was, I think, very successful at bringing a modern version of Holmes, particularly, again, in the early two series. That's a, again, that sort of went uh, on its own way. Um, but we, we, I, we need a period. A period home. So home set in his, his natural milieu, as it were. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's, I feel it coming. I just think somebody's going to go, let's go back and do it with all the production values that we can bring to it now. Yeah, yeah. And that'd be very yeah. interesting to see that. I well, think. it is. And I mean, really, I mentioned The Hound in, in one sense, with all the CGI now that you could get a really good Hound. Um, or, or just, you know, do, do another adventure where you've got some threatening creature that uh, would, would oh. threaten Holmes. But whatever, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, David, let's take a break. We need to get a word in from the show's sponsor. Okay, we're back. Well, let's talk about, um, I also want to talk about your plays. Um, ah. You are a play, uh, you're a playwright, and you yeah. have had, let me see, I want to make sure I get this right. I have one fixed point, The Life and Death of Sherlock Holmes. That's one of oh, right. them, yeah. correct? That's good. Well, that was a little entertainment, a sort of 25 minute thing, which I did for the Northern Musgraves. Interestingly enough, um, it, we may be doing that again uh, as a Zoom production oh, for the yeah. Sherlock Holmes for the Sherlock Holmes Society at their AGM. It has been suggested, so we're doing some investigations. Again, I second that idea. Do it uh, again. <laughs> it's, it's I'm I'm okay to to rejig it slightly to bring it more up to date and so forth. But I need someone to say uh, I know how to put the pictures on the screen. <laughs> yeah, because we we'd all be in different. <laughs> right. locations it's yeah a technical challenge yeah yeah okay but well you've also written sherlock holmes the last act i think that's the one i'm the most familiar with yeah and that had a that was quite successful i, I think wasn't it it was very successful because uh the, the, the behind that was I, when i was editing uh sherlock magazine i used to travel around going to see uh, Sherlock Holmes plays and so to, to review them and so forth and I went to one in Stoke uh, which is in the Potteries uh, a bit lower down than, than the north um, <laughs> and uh, saw a, a production of The Hound of the Baskervilles which starred Roger Llewellyn. Uh, now Roger wasn't part of the uh, repertory company but he'd been brought up from London to play Holmes and I thought he was very good and I interviewed him after the, the show and uh, I said, well, are you, you, you like playing Holmes? He said, I love playing Holmes. He said, what I'd like to do is a one-man show, Sherlock Holmes. And I said, oh, no, I don't think that's possible. You couldn't have Holmes <laughs> without uh, Watson, you know. Um, and that would left it at that. And 
And then I was driving home and the idea came to me, uh, the basic premise of the last act is Holmes has come back from Watson's funeral and goes over their life together, unveiling one or two things he never told him in, in life. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wrote the first act and through a convolutions, I, I managed to get uh, Roger's London address and sent him the script and said, how do you like this? So I, I got the phone call. David, it's brilliant. It's wonderful. Oh, get on with act two. Well, I must do this. Oh, how excited was I at that? So I got on with act two. About three weeks later, sent it off. Got the phone call. It's terrible. <laughs> this, is dre <laughs> this is dreadful. <laughs> I said, what's wrong? He said, it's just the same as act one. Mm -hmm. This is the trick of the actor, he said, you have to introduce a new idea into act two to make it worthwhile. Gosh, what's the new idea? Wow. Um, and as it happens, you know, that, that speaks to his investment in the character. You know, he's, he's, he's. Oh, he's, absolutely. Yeah. And the production, you know, so mm -hmm. um, we were just, Catherine and I, we were just about to go on holiday for a, a, a period of time in, in Paris. So I spend a lot of time in Paris, as I always do anyway, cafes and bars, <laughs> uh, but, but with a notepad, scribbling ideas down. And I got the idea of um, Holmes confessing that he, he was responsible for his father's death. Um, and I wrote that, and, but I needed, I, I did want to include a, a section about the hound in it as well. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I wrote that and Roger said, that's what I'm after. And so eventually, eventually it was uh, presented at Chich uh, uh, Chichester uh, Theatre. And uh, then he toured with it. Yes, he toured with it um, for over 10 years. That's and he, he, yes, I remember. Well, you, you possibly remember he did it off Broadway for the BSI. And, uh, I do he, remember. He, he did it in France and he did it in... Uh, uh, various German locations. I used to say, actors off again, writer stays at home. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and then at one point he said, he, he rang me, he said, I need another play, another Sherlock Holmes play uh, to put in tandem with this. So I get a bit of variety. So that is why I, I, I wrote the second one. Which was Sherlock Holmes, Life and Death? Yes. Death right, and now, life, yeah. So yeah. death and life. So tell us a little bit about that one. Well, um, the, the the plot is basically um, Conan Doyle. Conan Doyle appears in, in in that one. Conan Doyle decides to kill Holmes off, as he as he did in real life, and uh, the the character doesn't want to die, as it were, um, and it's a it's a a bizarre story, a bizarre plot, because Doyle employs Professor Moriarty to kill uh, to kill Holmes. My favourite scene, if if, you, if I'm allowed, my favourite sure. scene in it is where Moriarty comes to see Holmes, a la in the the final problem. But but he says, you know, you're not a real character. Tell me, what was your mother's name? And Holmes can't do it. What was your father's name? Which university did you go to? And Holmes cannot answer. All this is dressing created by Arthur Conan Doyle. You do not exist. I do not exist. And it goes on. Like that. And it's it's a chilling moment for me, even now, to what to you know to talk about it, but to watch it on on stage. And Holmes realizes that. Um, he, you know, he has to do something about this. He, he has to continue in a literary form, if no other way. Yeah. And he, he manages to do so. Yeah. It's a, it's a, a lovely. I would, lovely love to see, I would love to see that. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, uh, uh, and again, it was um, a one man play. Uh, obviously, home, uh, Roger played 
he played the uh, Greenhouse Smith of, of the Strand, and he played Conan Doyle, <laughs> a little too Scottish for my liking. <laughs> um, uh, and he played uh, um, Doyle's father, Maul Jim uh, Arthur. It was <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, that's funny if you know the story about yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um yeah but the third play which you uh which got very very good reviews um was performed uh well it's uh, nearly two years ago now in edinburgh that was the final reckoning yeah i'd, I'd been up in edinburgh doing my little thing which i called uh you know the the art in the blood. It was it's all about it was Holmes and Doyle's career with extracts from the stories. I did it as a, a an hour show at, at the Edinburgh Festival. And while I was there, I met an actor who played uh, who had a show about Max Schreck, the man who played oh, yeah. uh, the vampire. Nosferatu, yes. Nosferatu, yeah. And uh, we we got talking in a bar one night, and he, he he confessed he was a Sherlock Holmes fan, you know, and so ooh. And uh, he said, why don't you write, write me a Sherlock Holmes play? So I had a go. Just write that. Just go write me one. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I, so I, I wrote this particular one. Uh, it was called uh, the final, Sherlock Holmes' the Final Reckoning. Um, and he liked it very much, but he'd had, it was Holmes and Watson in it. Um, and uh, it's, again, it's a, it investigates their relationship through a strange scenario. The play opens with the sound of hammering on a door. And then you hear Holmes's voice saying, let me out, let me out. I did not kill Dr. Watson. <laughs> and he goes on from there. <laughs> uh, so it did, it did very, very well. Um, and there were t was talk about doing it on the tour, but that, that felt it's difficult to get plays produced as you probably know yeah so it, it's a shame because i the actor uh playing holmes was well both of them actually holmes and watson were very good but michael daviot is uh, uh, not a famous name at all but he had the look he had the, the height and the physique of a rathbone uh, mm -hmm. and with the delicacy of a brat he was he was very very good wow that sounds great wow yeah, I would love the I would love to see the see them all here yeah. at some point. Yeah. So David, you are okay, so we've talked a lot about Sherlock Holmes. You you are also a pastiche writer. You've written like five or six Sherlock Holmes novels, right? Is that correct? <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> Nine. <laughs> Nine. Oh, okay. I'm behind. I'm behind To be fair, the ninth one is not published yet it's going to be published in january of next year well uh, yeah. yeah i gotta um, get caught up <laughs> yeah. yeah so you know at what point did you decide to i know, I know you write detective fiction too we'll talk about that in a moment as well but yeah. uh, but um uh, what are your challenges when you're writing a sherlockian pastiche what do you think about when you're when you're sitting down to do it well, I've always tried um, uh, to inject some element of originality into it. I, I, I didn't want to do an absolute copy, copycat Conan Doyle. He'd done it. He's done it, you know. And, and quite, a, quite often, uh, there, there, are, no, there are a lot of other people who do exactly that. Uh, so I always wanted to bring something which was a little bit, Bending the willow, really. You know, just, just, just always being true to Holmes and, and Watson as characters, to the spirit of the adventures and the stories. So nothing ridiculous, um, but um, but at the same time being true to Doyle in one sense, but also adding on something that wouldn't offend Doyle. I mean, I think you know. If Arthur Conan Doyle were alive today, he probably wouldn't want to be writing Sherlock Holmes stories anyway. But um, <laughs> no, uh, I, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he would have developed um, uh, the stories a bit more and done a little bit more and bring surprises in. I mean, you know, he he he, he must have been a little bit frustrated during the writing of the memoirs. Oh, I, I better invent a brother 
for Sherlock. And, right. You know, and, uh, you, yeah. Uh, I'll get well, home. even over the course of la the later stories, you can see the um, you can see the the style evolving into a more modern style. You know, yes, um, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And because um, he was, he didn't think of himself as writing, you know, historical fiction. He was writing contemporary stories. And absolutely, it's so, it's so interesting that um, until the Rathbone Hound, uh, all the films that led up to that were set in the, the period in which they were filmed. Uh, you know, there wasn't the sort of the uh, handsome cabin and and the, all that. Victorian paraphernalia, and it was Rathbone who who dragged well the the film company, Twentieth Century Fox, who dragged them back to uh, to, to the uh, to pea supers and everything. Right, exactly. The um, well, that's so interesting. Now let's talk a little bit. We're getting how's our time? We're getting close to our time. I can't believe right. it. time goes by so fast. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about your your um your non Sherlockian detective novels. Let me see you. Um, I got. I have a little cheat sheet over here because I know about the Johnny Hawk novels. You've, yeah, it's a series, right? Yeah, it, it, I, I did five of them, um, all set in the Second World War. Um, it, it's a, a sort of poor man's Raymond <laughs> Chandler, really. Uh, it's set in set in wartime London, but it's a you know it's a, a, a one boy. It's a, a lovely idea because he, he he joined the army at the beginning of the war, lost his eye, and in in training so it became a, a one eye and the, they invalided him out and he was a policeman before but they did no use for him as a proper policeman only a desk job so he sets himself up as a private detective in water on london so there were six books on that and then the last one which was out earlier this year oh, last year 2020 was called uh spiral of lies and i moved him up to 1950 mm. so we've got a cold war element in that but the the exciting news is the american publisher uh just picked up a, a new one of mine uh, featuring a new character uh called rupert wilde and he he's working in the early 20s 1920s with an indian assistant so it's it's a, almost um poirot and hastings with uh lord peter whimsy and bunter kind oh, of thing it's very much <laughs> it's very much uh, an agatha christie whodunit very golden which, age which, in its, in its. which i haven't done a whodunit before uh not not quite in that way they're um, hard to plot i understand i've never done one but uh, no they're difficult to plot yes yeah. Yeah. yeah i am an instinctive writer um i start with an idea and let it take me where it goes um i remember when I was um, editing Sherlock magazine and I interviewed various people, there's two writers in particular who, who said, I'll be quick because we're running out of time. Uh, P.D. James said she planned her novel so concisely and precisely that she, get, she could get up on a Monday morning and write chapter 10 and get up on Tuesday morning and write chapter 2. It was so set in that. Whereas Ian Rankin, who does the Inspector Rebus books, says, I just start. He said, I've just killed somebody in chapter five. I've no idea why, and I don't know who did it, but it'll work itself out. And that, that's how I, uh, so I work. That's so funny. Well, um, I also just, we have a couple minutes left. I just want to talk also about, um, so you are a member of the, of the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. Yeah. And the Baker Street Regulars. Yeah. And the Detection um, Club. And the detection, yeah. Is this the same detection club that has been going continuously? That was yeah. Uh, th this is the joy of, of that. Is it, that originally it was set up by Dorothy L. Sayers and two, a few of her writing cronies. But they asked Arthur Conan Doyle to be the president, and it was right at the end of Doyle's life when when he was too ill to do it. He died shortly after the uh, the, the club was was uh, announced, and. Uh, uh, it's through my work with the Crime Rights Association as much as anything. And also, I suppose, my connection with Sherlock Holmes, because I'm, I'm a Sherlock Holmes man, I, I'm, as you are, no doubt. They, they, come, they come to you for the Sherlock Holmes questions, don't they? No, they do. Um, yes. uh, and so uh, you, I, there's a ceremony. You have to go through a ceremony, and uh, there's a skull, and you put <laughs> your hand scary. on the skull. 
uh, and then you are a member of the detection club, which which is fabulous. And the, the only thing about the t detection club is it it has under normal circumstances two dinners a year. That's all it is. Uh, oh, and th they bring out books occasionally. So th there is a new one out all about the art of writing uh, or the difficulties of writing. And I've got a, a piece in there on <laughs> on writer's block. <laughs> <laughs> they always say, write what you know about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always been fascinated by the Detection Club because it was started by, you know, Dorothy L. Sayers and, uh, you know, and, I, I, you know, the, I think Christie was involved, wasn't Christy, she? Yeah. I think Ronald Knox was in it early too. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, you know, they would tour the Black Museum and talk about Jack the Ripper and you know, yeah. all yeah. that amazing stuff. So, well, David, we are just about out of time. So I just want to, I just want to say thank you. This has been such fun. It, it's been great. I mean, it's a great pleasure. But I mean, <laughs> I suppose basically, there's nothing nicer than talking about yourself, is there? <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> thank you for being so gentle with me. <laughs> it's been so fun. I, you know, I always enjoy hanging out with you and me whenever those rare occasions we can actually do. Yeah. Well, well, let's hope that, you know, will happen soon. Yeah, sooner uh, than later. It, it, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, this, the sadness of not being able to come to New York and do all that and... Mm. Blah blah blah. Yeah, it's quite a grief. It is. How 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 uh, strong is the lockdown where you are? Well, things are actually dramatically improving here. So. Um, oh, good. Yeah, they're rolling out vaccines, and the, and our numbers, all the numbers that they pay attention to, are coming down, at least here. So. Um, and, and are, are restaurants open there? They are. They have like fifty percent capacity, but. Yeah. 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 So. You know, unless there's some setback, I think we're, 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 we'll be all right. But I know that other parts of the world are struggling, so. Yeah, yeah. That's the whole thing, because it, it doesn't matter how, how well your country is doing, if, if the rest of the world, because you can't fly anyway, you, can't, you know, sort of. Right, uh, and you know, in this wonderful hobby that we have, we have friends um, all around the world and that yeah. you know, we look forward to those opportunities when we can visit in person yeah. and that's a yeah. i've always said i've always said you know about a shilokian group you can go into a room full of shilokians and there could be different nationalities different religions different uh, um, levels of society and everything and you just get on you just get on it's so true it's, it's, it really it's, is. A, ma it's a magic brew that just filters yeah. through to it's yeah, a special yeah. thing indeed well, David, we must draw this visit to a close, unfortunately, but I'm, it's been lovely and I am very, uh, I've had such a great time. So I'm very Thank grateful. You. And that's it for this episode of the Fortnite Dispatch brought to you by the Baker Street Regulars. What a great conversation that was. <laughs> I want to um, thank you for the kind comments that have been coming in. Um, very, very much appreciated. and. Um, and um, we're so grateful for the support that you've been sending us. So keep keep um, going to the YouTube channel and subscribe. So whenever we have a new episode, you'll automatically be notified. But you'll see us all over uh, social media as well. Until next time, we do have a <laughs> we have a guest next time that you do not want to miss. So I just want to give you a heads up right now. And so until that time, take care, and I look forward to seeing you then.